Hello, this is Pastor David Charlton. This is my devotion for Wednesday, August the 5th, 2020. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass come from thee, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. As a mother stills her child, Thou canst hush the ocean wild. Boisterous waves obey thy will. When thou sayest to them be still, Wondrous sovereign of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When at last I reach the shore and the fearful breakers roar, twixt me and the peaceful rest, then while leaning on thy breast, may I hear thee say to me, Fear not, I will pilot thee. That's the song, Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me, by Edward Hopper. Today we look at the gospel for this coming Sunday, August the 9th. It comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. As I've been doing all week, I'm going to ask those four questions. Um, what does this teach us about history? What does this teach us about Christ? What does this teach us about discipleship? What does this teach us about heaven? Today I'm going to deal with the history very briefly. The events recorded in this passage happened immediately after the feeding of the 5,000 that we heard about last Sunday. And so the lesson picks up there. Immediately he sent the disciples across the lake on the boat. He sent the crowds away and he went up on the mountain. The sea, of course, is the Sea of Galilee. So the mountain is one of the mountains on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. What does this teach us about Christ? One thing it teaches us is that Jesus is no ghost. Um, we need to emphasize that sometimes because people misunderstand the message of, of Easter. It is not simply that 
all of us have immortal souls and that our souls live on after death. If that's all it meant, then Jesus would be a ghost who comes to visit us from time to time. But the Bible is very clear that when the disciples saw Jesus on that first Easter, they were not seeing a ghost. They were not seeing a spirit or a soul that was disembodied the way we think of in things like the haunted mansion. They saw a human being with a body and a soul and a spirit speaking to them. Jesus is no ghost. He was raised from the dead and he lives now and for eternity and he lives as a human being with a body, a soul, a mind, and a spirit. One day, the Bible promises us, we will be raised with a body, a soul, a mind, and a spirit. We will not be ghosts either. Jesus is risen. He is no ghost. Another thing to notice about this is when Jesus says, it is I, the literal translation is not that it is I, but is I am. Obviously, that's a reference to the name of God revealed in the Old Testament. By saying those simple words, I am, Jesus was pointing to the fact that he was God incarnate in the flesh. The power that he has over the water recalls God's power over the waters at the very beginning where he commanded the waters to be separated from the dry land and the waters obeyed. Also to the time when God parted the waters of the Red Sea and said to the waters, you stay there and you stay there and the waters remained. God makes chaos into creation. And one of the symbols of that is God's power even over the sea, um, that it follows his law. And so the disciples recognized that this truly was the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he brings the power of God to save into our lives. Another thing that we might notice about this is this is a graphic illustration of Jesus' promise to his disciples. I am with you always to the end of the age. Even though Jesus was separated from his disciples, he was on the mountain. They were far away on the sea. He could come to them and save them at any moment that they needed him. Maybe a fourth thing to notice is that he came to them in the fourth watch of the night. I always like to compare that to the fourth quarter in a football game. It is never too late. God may seem to be delayed, but he is always able to come and save us, even when everything seems to be against us. God is more than able to pull the game out in the fourth quarter. So there's no such thing as too late for God. One final thing is to notice what Jesus was doing while they were there. He was praying. Um, Jesus is always in prayer. And even now in heaven, Jesus intercedes for us. What does this teach us about discipleship? Well, it teaches us for one thing, that the, the title of a disciple is you of little faith. Peter wasn't alone in his weak faith. All 12 disciples were men of little faith. And all Christians are people of little faith. Um, we struggle just like the disciples to trust Jesus and to believe that he really is able to say what he promises. And yet the good news for us, one of my professors from seminary used to point out, is that God works with people of little faith. And even people of little faith can accomplish God's will if God is working through them. So we don't need to feel that we're inadequate, inadequate Christians because we are people of little faith, because so were the first disciples. But it's exactly those kind of people that God comes to save. Now this, this story has always been seen as a depiction of life in the church. And so the church is sometimes depicted as a ship going through the sea. Uh, the ship is storm tossed, waves wash over the ship. It may seem that it's about to sink, but yet it never will because it is the ship 
of the church, the ship of Christ. When I was a little boy, I used to look up at the ceiling of my dad's church in Kissimmee, Florida, First Christian Church. And like the church here at St. Paul, it, it had a peak, but the ceiling was all made of wood. And if you looked at it, it looked like a ship turned upside down. Churches are designed that way. This portion of the, of the church right here is called the nave. It's like a ship. The, the church is the ship. But Christ is never far away from his church to save her and protect her. Even in the midst of fear and terror. So when the ship is tossed, we need to remember this story. One other important element of this story is what happens with Peter. We as disciples are often like Peter. Lord, I want to do your will. I want to serve you. And God, I'm going to do it. I can do it. We set out on our own to show God how much we trust him and what good disciples we are. And when we do that, we inevitably fall. We look around us and we realize that we're way in over our heads. But Jesus is there to save us. Um, the prayer that we pray in church, Lord have mercy, is very much like the prayer of Peter. And so the right choice, instead of trying to go out there on our own, is to walk with Jesus. So when Peter walked on his own, he began to sink. But when Jesus took him by the hand and walked with him, he was able to get back into the boat. All of our discipleship, all of our lives as Christians is done through Christ, not by our own power. We have to depend on Christ constantly. We have to hold his hand and follow him and not try to do it on our own. We don't have to show him how good we are. We need to trust him to lead us and guide us. Finally, what does this teach us about heaven? Well, there's not a lot about heaven in this. But one of the commentaries I read said that um, in some ways, the situation of the boat on the lake is like the church. We've already talked about that. But in the sense that even though Jesus is not physically there in the boat, he is still praying for his disciples. He's on top of the mountain praying for them. And he knows everything that's going on with them already. We don't see Jesus physically walking around the church anymore. Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. And he's interceding for us. So we're not alone. Jesus is praying to his Father all the time. He watches over us and he prays for us. And because he is at God's right hand, we know that the Heavenly Father will give him anything he asks. So we're, we have this reminder that our Lord already is in heaven, interceding for us. Another thing we might remember is that just as Jesus got into the boat and helped his disciples re their, reach their destination, he will help us reach our final destination as well. And the final end of that will be the end as, as we see it in this story, which will be worshiping Christ and declaring that he truly is the Son of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have called us to be your disciples, and we are so eager to do your will, and we're so eager to show you how dedicated we are to you. But Lord, that's the wrong path. Instead, you call us to follow you. You say that you will walk with us. We will take your yoke upon us, which means that we will walk together, you and us, and you will guide us through the storm. God, we pray for your church. Your church seems to have so many enemies today, but because you are at the right hand of God praying, the church will not sink, it will not be destroyed. And Lord, let us remember your final promise to your disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. I am with you always to the end of the age. Lord, let us trust that promise that you are with us. Let us not try to act on our own, but always with you and through you, even as you act and work through us. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. May our Lord Jesus 
who promise to be with us always, be with you today and lead you through the storms of your life. Amen.